Okay, welcome to Milliways. Welcome to our next talk. Um, we all know how hard it is to set up some kind of service on the connected intertubes. Um, but it's even harder keeping it running, you know, with lots of people wanting to access your service, uh, malicious intent or not. Uh, and our next speaker, Craig, will give us uh, some insights on the uh, history of DDoS attacks and how you can handle them. Please give him a warm applause. <laughs> okay, thank you. So at first, so you know a little bit about, about me, I have uh, lots of IT experience and for 20 years I'm already doing, working in IT and doing CCC events. So the interesting thing maybe is that I'm also with the CCC NOC, the Internet Manufacturer. Um, so the, the area I'm talking about is mostly in the premium managed hosting area because that's where I'm employed. So it's a high security environment, mostly web hosting. We host some government websites, which uh, you surely know. And of course, due to that, we get a fair share of DDoS. So parts of this talk, I have to uh, give a short disclaimer. I will do a very short introduction to DDoS, talk about the changing landscape from 2012 to uh, just now, um, talk about surviving application layer DDoS, and then we'll have a short uh, few key takeaways. So the disclaimer, everything I say is publicly available knowledge. Maybe you don't know where to find it, but if you look, you can find it in Hua's DNS trace route, RAL, BGP toads from Ben Jojo. In public biddings, there are often technical specifications which explain what they're expecting from your DDoS mitigation. There's news articles, sometimes our own customers have been leaking some kind of information to the press. You can find stuff on mailing lists, GitHub, our blogs. There's actually been some kleine Anfrage in the Bundestag about DDoS. So it's uh, funny because we're also hosting the site that has the PDFs for that, which is funny yeah, uh, for us. <coughs> So, yeah, we also have a privacy policy on the websites which explains some cookie stuff we're doing. Of course, you can just DDoS us and then you will find out that we have mitigation and how it works. Uh, of course, some X access values have been removed <coughs> and some of the information I'm talking about is not directly from the company but from, for example, Cloudflare quarterly reports or stuff. So, it's not internal secret knowledge. And of course, I'm talking about DDoS in general. So what is DDoS? Of course, there's an XKCD for it. So it says, like, hackers briefly took down the website of the CIA yesterday. People hear that the website have been, has been hacked. But what computer experts like you hear is someone tore down a poster hung up by the CIA. So it's not hacking. It's not infiltrating the systems. It's using a service that are uh, that is offered by the website just too much so that no one else can use it anymore. Right? So you send too much, uh, you overwhelm the target by sending too much uh, network traffic, too many sessions, too many requests, too many dynamic requests to searches, for example. And just think of it of too many people visiting a shop and ordering food, which we've actually done at the chaos communication. Um, and at the end of the year, there were just too many people visiting uh, the Dunkin' Donuts, and then <laughs> there was just no possibility for random normal people to get the donut anymore, right? So, some questions for you, so that I uh, get to know the audience a bit better. Uh, who of you has been DDoSed? Well, quite a few. Who was down as a result? Okay. Who is confident they can survive DDoS at, at work? Oh, some are like, maybe, okay, <laughs> yeah. And who has done DDoS? <laughs> I see some hands. <laughs> Good luck, you're not uh, being videotaped. Um, so, yeah, okay, I, I also did it, but against our own uh, websites, of course. So let's talk about pre-2012, the good old days, as I call it. There wasn't uh, many issues with DDoS. Uh, we had pro probably less than one attack uh, per year. No proper DDoS uh, protection. But why didn't we have proper DDoS detect, uh, protection? Well, our customers said, well, this is not in the public bidding budget. So it's an Ausschreibung, a public bidding. 
and it's not part of it, so you don't have to provide it. So if you're down because of DDoS, that's all fine with the customer. Well, okay. And they also said they don't mind if they're offline. So my own boss also back then, uh, he said, yeah, we're within SLA, DDoS is not our responsibility, of course. Why should we build something that's uh, not being paid for? And they always stop after an hour anyways. So uh, we still, I still ask a mitigation provider. So back then it was like 30 terabytes traffic per month or like 30,000 euros. That's less than 100 megabits. So very expensive back then. Then came 20, uh, 2012, so Anonymous um, gathered and they used uh, Twitter to distribute um, like uh, pictures like this. So they had a, rep um, um, they, yeah, they published uh, this and people were supposed to go on a website to uh, attack some sites with weblog, so which is a, a pretty easy tool to use. And of course, we uh, also followed the invitation to the channel and to monitor what they were doing and how they were attacking us. Back then, we didn't have good protection, so basic, uh, so actually we were down for a few minutes due to uh, one of these attacks. But they said uh, quite, uh, well, that's the red part. So they said, oh, let's try it again tomorrow with weblog. So thank you for telling us uh, about the tooling so we, we could just mitigate it easily. And unknown to us, G GCHQ DDoS Anonymous, like Anonymous uh, Chat uh, IRC, uh, with Rolling Thunder, which is their own DDoS platform they were using. And people got searched and arrested because they took part in these attacks from their home computers. Um, so yeah, people got, people got arrested and as a result, attacks became less powerful even. So 2013 to 2014, there was lots of uh, innovation going on. New trend was UDP reflection. So spam holes uh, got DDoS for several days. Cloudflare got DDoS. They were actually offline for uh, some longer time. In the US, uh, the this, this CISA um, published a report about these attacks. And that made them even become uh, more widely used. So how to survive that? Well, have UDP filters from an ISP. Um, for us, as a hoster, uh, I'm hosting HTTP websites, HTTPS. Why would I need UDP on that? So that was really, really easy for us to filter. So 2015, other things happened. In, in 2014, the Ukraine-Donbas war. And on the 7th January 2015, the Ukrainian Prime Minister visited Berlin. And that they wanted uh, some money. And as soon as he lands there, the foreign, foreign office is down, the German Bundestag, the Chancellor Merkel's website, everything's down, and they have a, a prepared message that they are responsible for this due to uh, the Ukrainian war. <coughs> and they don't want us, uh, don't want Germany to give any money to Ukraine. So back then, we didn't have, um, because of the public bidding thing, we only had very small connectivity. The knock from our ISP actually removed the UDP filters we had uh, gotten previously. We got black hole in Frankfurt. Uh, we got black hole everywhere. We don't have much spare hardware, no general layer 7 mitigation uh, solution. So to survive, we just used Cloudflare. There were some online protection, uh, origin protection issues, but after like six to eight hours, we were online again, which was fine for us. Our customer was also happy about this, but not, of course, not everyone likes Cloudflare. Well, they, they can look into your traffic. You have the uh, privacy concerns. There was some press article on netspolitik.org, which was taken uh, very seriously. And layers, uh, the ability to look into all layer seven traffic uh, was an argument um, for doing something else and not using them anymore. So we started our own very small modest mitigation. It's not like we're, we're not trying to be Cloudflare. We try to do the on-prem part uh, very well. And if we need a partner to do something more like big traffic QBDP attacks, that's outsourced to, um, well, not outsourced, but they implement filters we tell them to implement. So in 2015 to 2016, there was uh, also some more innovation going on on the DDoS front. Layer 3, Layer 4 attacks became more popular. Um, we saw small spoofed synth floods, usually maybe around the one, 1 gigabit, which is the typical size of a rented server. 
And uh, of course, low and slow attacks also got popular, like uh, slow post things. There you can see um, the referer, actually. It's pretty nice of them to send the referer, so it's easier to block. Um, and how to survive this? Of course, you just increase capacity. Always make sure you can handle line rate um, and, well, have an upstream that can filter for you. And you, need, of course, need to rethink all timeouts. If someone connects to their web server, why would, would they be idle for like five minutes, right? That takes up valuable resources. So 2016 to 2017, hmm, the previous attacks um, uh, continued, but there were uh, WordPress pingback uh, attacks, which are also pretty easy to filter out. Their pattern base cannot be changed. But of course, when the first attack like this hits you, uh, you need to implement a filter. Previously, you didn't know about this. And there's lots of different other layer 7 attacks that can hit you. So you need to know about these in order to filter them. <coughs> 2017 to 2021, now it's getting more recent, um, there were more and more mostly dynamic requests. So for example, you use a slash uh, question mark ID and some random thing because then it has to hit your backend server um, and uh, your cache can't deliver it. So um, yeah, it's tar targeting backend uh, resources, actually. There were also new sources like squid proxies, microtik router botnets, and uh, I think one of the first botnets with more like 10,000 bots uh, attacking us uh, with layer 7 attacks. So from 2021 to February 2022, there was um, even more layer 7 attacks, more HTTP, more pipelining, also due to the Meris botnet uh, using pipelining, high request per second attacks, and again, random, um, random parameters in order to bypass caching, of course. Lots of new sources, hack GitLab servers, um, which are usually pretty powerful, which is uh, way worse than having a IoT botnet attack you, because these servers are just so much more powerful bigger residential botnets, and a lot more attacks via Tor. And also rented IP space was now being used. Um, yeah, so they would just rent IP space and uh, use it for a while just to perform layer 7 attacks. So February 2022 to now, well, of course, the, uh, the second uh, Ukrainian war started. And uh, well, what do you think? Did we get more DDoS? Of course we did. So there are, there are new sources now, uh, which is also in the Cloudflare quarterly report. There's uh, dozens of clouds using at the same time. So suddenly you have like, oh, uh, Google is attacking us, Microsoft Cloud is attacking us, uh, Linode, and everyone is, uh, is just uh, doing layer 7 requests. Attacks through Tor also increased. Google um, published some information about that. They had an attack that had one point three uh, million requests per second over Tor. And then, um, this is from source of Team Sumeru, I hope I pronounced it right. Um, they found out that uh, no name, uh, this no name uh, Russian actor, um, that they had two interlinked hosting providers, and these providers are only used to perform layer 7 DDoS. So, um, there's also now uh, the Didosia project, uh, project by No Name. They run kind of paid DDoS. They are promising that they will, at a later uh, point, they will pay for people who have performed DDoS attacks. So they pay like a few cents per request that they have been sending. And of course, again, this is an old, uh, um, an old method, also used by Anonymous before. They use, well, now they use Telegram instead of Twitter, but you see um, they're asking other people to help attack. And some of these people um, already have botnets, so you have a lot of different botnets suddenly attacking at some point. And they are also now using paid expensive proxies. So behind all of this, there's, there's some money, and this costs some money to implement if you um, rent proxies that cost like a few thousand euros per day. So, um, yeah, they actually managed to take down lots of sites. That got a lot of media attention, and they're really a serious threat. And Anonymous Sudan even took down Microsoft, right? There were these issues with Teams, which some of you may have experienced. And um, they had very good, um, powerful layer 7 attacks. And of course, current attacks 
uh, current uh, events cause attacks. So when Ukraine wieder Ukraine wieder aufbauen dot de uh, got online, um, you saw on the f uh, on the other slide, they were immediately they were starting attacks. Or if they when they decided to deliver tanks to Ukraine, of course the attacks start again. So. But how to survive this? We've seen that a lot uh, more and more attacks on layer 7, but why is it problematic? So, oh, something flew away? Okay. Um, so <laughs> it's a bit windy. <laughs> okay. So, uh, why is this problematic? Well, it's, it's hard to distinguish from a residential botnet and proxies and cloud. Like, is it a legitimate source? Um, and these sources, they're doing full HTTP requests to your site, which can uh, which use up some resources. This, all, this causes high load, and they're uh, querying dynamic websites, which means they try to um, attack your backend capacity. So, should we block on known patterns? Is that a good idea? Or maybe um, requests per IP? What about proxies, like a telco uh, carrier grade NAT proxy? Or should we limit bandwidth per IP? Also bad with the proxy, probably. How do we distinguish uh, an attack from real traffic? Or should we just use more capacity, add more VMs, have Kubernetes horizontal pod autoscaler and just spawn up a thousand uh, instances? Well, what, what's the best way? To understand this, I have some, some uh, details. Um, this is the HTTP that's sent by the classic weblog web attack, which I'd shown before. That was the interface, and this is what it actually sends to you. So, this is the interesting part. Um, the impact is you, you'll get a cache bypass. You will be they are trying to hit backend servers and, well, cause backend server load, of course. So, what happens if you block on We Are Legend? Well, this happens. They just use uh, this parameter. It's the basically the same. Just uh, yeah, you don't need the second parameter to do a cache bypass. What about this one? If you decided to filter on on the ID thing, well, they can just rotate it instead of K U uh, Y. They will just write something else. Again, you have a cache bypass. What about this one? This even looks valid. It's not valid um, because the correct one would be 61. But 62 will also hit the back end if you don't have any filters in your caching and your load balancing front end. So, and it even looks valid. It's uh, harder to see even. What about this one? You use a search term. Uh, you just send queries to the search all the time. And if you have 50,000 bots and each bot does a request per second, hmm, well, you're very probably, you're, you're down immediately. And this is, of course, valid. Even this, this is a valid uh, backend query. Maybe your load balancer can handle 30,000 um, of these requests, but what about 300 or 3 million? Then uh, you, will, you will have an issue with bandwidth, um, possibly too, um, or with uh, memory pressure or, or things like that on your load balancers. And what's the an engineering solution? Well, just increase capacity. Yeah, how to do one attacker with a hack GitLab server can maybe do 30,000 requests uh, per second. One server, how, how many search uh, queries can it answer per second? 30,000? Well, you can have one server for each attacker, right? So horizontal pod autoscaling is not a good option. The only thing, the top priority is stopping abusive clients from reaching back-end servers. How are we going to do that? So, um, I'll quickly introduce uh, you to a typical uh, setup. So, well, you have the internet, traffic flows from top to bottom. You have the internet, your routers attached uh, to it. You, maybe you have a mitigation appliance, a firewall load balancer, application server, and you're able, of course, to, do moni uh, to monitor everything. So, should we use a mitigation appliance? What about TLS 1.2, TLS 1.3 traffic? If you terminate it on the mitigation device, it has to have this performance. Hmm. Usual mitigation devices that can handle like 10 gigabits or, or more of, of traffic per second, or um, let's say 100,000 handshakes per second, they're super expensive. They're not scalable. You can't just horizontally put 10 there, so you can handle, let's say, a million requests or something. They don't have a good API, uh, generally, no custom settings, you can't build custom stuff, they're super expensive, so of course not an option. Well, let's use data we already have. So from monitoring, we already know 
um, how many requests um, uh, usually happen on which side, how many traffic is uh, transferred, um, how much requests my backend can do, what's the usual baseline for my backend. Uh, we all have that data. Um, but should we block someone who's um, doing more, more traffic? What about the proxy user, for example, in a company, and then there's like 10 people going to your site? Immediately, that would be higher, right? So the solution is you verify the clients. You don't use an appliance. You use your load balancer, inspect the queries, and if it's over a certain limit, you can just redirect it to service that verifies that the client is valid. Of course, you have to write some code. Um, there are some solutions available, not, but not um, very good ones. So we had to write our own, actually. So I hope this is not too small. Um, yeah, I'll just quickly go over it. So basically, it works like this. If uh, an unknown client um, has done too many queries, he's uh, being redirected to this Inodia solution. It looks, if there's a valid query, well, yes, then um, it can access the backend. If it doesn't have a valid cookie, it's being uh, redirected by the load balancer uh, yeah, to, to the Inodia system. It presents a task. The, the task has to be solved. It can be a JavaScript, button click, a captcha, whatever you want to do. And then if the solution is uh, correct, it sends an error. Uh, if, if it's uh, not correct, it sends an error. If the solution is correct, a token is being sent back as a cookie. And then it starts from the beginning, and the client gets authenticated. If it's trying that too often, of course, it also gets blocked. So this is the, the usual one. Ours is a bit ugly, so I just uh, stole uh, the, the, pre the look from Cloudflare, which you probably all have seen before. So this is the usual thing, what happens there. They do some cryptographic operations, a proof of work in the background. And after your computer has done it, it's authenticated. So what else can we do? So um, we can use a control plane. So we have uh, data in the load balancers about the people who are doing too many requests already. Like there's a client doing 10,000 requests per second. Why would we continue to serve it? We just, uh, from the load balancer, we push via an API to the firewall, and we can drop the client on layer um, 3 already in the firewall. So there's no, no load on the load balancer anymore. And then also, um, you can import block lists for IPs, ASNs. Uh, it can be hard or soft blocking. So if you have a very suspicious um, Russian AS, which only sends a bad traffic to you, mm, you can soft block it, and it will on always go through verification. Of course, this all should be built with CI CD, so you check if, if there's a net that's too big, uh, sanity checks, all of that. But the important thing is you can al also block ASNs, because as we've seen, some of these layer 7 attackers, they, they have fixed ASNs they're using to attack. So. This is an example for abuse.ch for their botnet tracker. Um, so we just uh, create a little bit of JSON. We have the CI CD pipeline. And then it just gets deployed into the firewalls. Another thing um, that's a bit new, maybe, that uh, we haven't really seen before is a DDoS bug. So that's an unknown stability issue. So your servers are, or your software is becoming unstable only under very high load con uh, reconnections um, and with certain configs which maybe wasn't tested um, by the software vendor. So does this happen? Of course it does, otherwise I wouldn't have put it here. So there are just two examples uh, for HA proxy. So layer 7 requests weren't locked, so you didn't see all these requests that were um, being performed. So an attacker would do this special kind of request. You would look into your server log, and there was nothing there. Your CM, your all your analyze, uh, analyzer systems, they wouldn't see anything, but the request still happened. And there was another work that HA proxy instances were getting crashed. So reproducer is interesting. This is from the GitHub issue. Around 200k current connections are doing a get slash at the same time. Hmm, what could that have been? Well, of course, under DDoS, this uh, feature became unstable. But all of these are fixed now, of course. 
So what else to do? You need to do your homework. You need to um, have all your data. You need visibility. You need uh, every. You need to know everything. Your HTTP front end, error calls, backend requests, latencies, bandwidth, packets per second, TTL. From where is your traffic arriving? What are the ASN sources? Um, you need to look into your systems about the load, pressure stall, disk or memory usage. Just monitor everything so that if something happens, you can have a look afterwards. Super important. So, how to survive this? Of course, if you have all this data, you do an excessive post-mortem. Even if it takes 10 people a whole week, you do the post-mortem because you don't want to get crashed by that again. You analyze, of course, the whole attack. You build test cases, so you have a reproducer. You give it the reproducer to the software vendor so they will fix it. Of course, you report that upstream because you want to have it fixed for everyone. So, and this means we will add your technical and distinctiveness to our own. Your zero days burned if you attack us. We will, we will make sure you can't use it again. So, key, key takeaways. Engineer a general solution for issues. So, layer 7 defense is essential nowadays. Um, capture and use all the system data you have. Like I said, everything needs to uh, have an API so different systems can talk to each other. Um, of course, do post-mortems for DDoS and also test your systems. DDoS your own systems um, or have someone do it for you. There are some providers that will do that for you. Well, sometimes, f also for us, sometimes you lose. This is an old uh, picture, um, but sometimes you win. We also monitor them and they said in the channel after they attacked us, why are all websites fast? Hmm, we won this time. Thank you. <laughs> so, so just uh, one more thing. Well, maybe you've already had read it. You can use ddos-test.com to non-invasively test your website. It looks at timeouts and things like that. So uh, it's a neat tool uh, you can use to improve your own defense. Thank you very much, Craig. So, uh, as you mentioned, um, we've got some time for Q&A. Are there any questions in the audience? Okay. Um, we have a pretty lively microphone stand uh, over here. Please, everyone who has a question, line up over there. So, uh, yeah, you can ask your questions from a centralized point. Make a nice queue. Okay, let's get started. Can't hear you, sorry. Can you hear me? No? Hello? Oh, no, it's working. Okay. So, mainly your talk was about uh, HTTP. Are other protocols are more robust against uh, or, or have other, uh, yeah, attack vectors or something? And additionally, what, what about HTTP uh, 4? Uh, three, sorry, HTTP. Ah, uh, yeah, three HTTP is three is really tricky because it's uh, based on UDP, uh, which is annoying um, because then you can't just easily apply all these filters, and there's still lots of reflectors out there, right? So um, there's different options you could do. Um, for example, um, you could fail gracefully, which means if you're getting attacked via UDP, you could stop serving HTTP three and just uh, only serve HTTP2 if, if that's what you choose. Um, yeah, there's some, some other ideas, some heuristics you can work on. So, yeah, I, I don't have a very good solution for that, too. It's a problem uh, many people will face, um, and it will be good for Cloudflare and other providers, because if people get DDoS with this stuff, they will move to the cloud, maybe. Yeah, hard to defend. Next question, please. Um, yeah, have you thought philosophically about what you're doing in terms of you're building a system which encourages the competition to sort of compete in a Turing test situation to differentiate its behavior from the yeah. machine to a human who actually wants access to your website. So yeah. they're just going to keep getting better. How do you deal with that problem? Well, it's for, for most attackers, they also need to spend time on you, right? There are these um, these butcher websites, which is basically DDoS for hire, and they offer Cloudflare bypasses. 
So, but we don't, we, if we were using Cloudflare, we would probably have been hit, uh, been hit by that. But our solution is different. We can't use the cloud because of the customers we have. So ours is different. So people would have to invest a lot of time to, um, to engineer a circumvention for that. Um, yeah, it's worth spending like a few weeks on engineering time on Cloudflare, but is it worth spending on us? Like, um, that's maybe an advantage. But yeah, of course, um, they could try using an interactive browser. Then we can enable button click. Then we can do captures. There's a lot of other tricks you can do. Like, um, um, yeah, uh, there's lots of other client verifications. These were just some examples. Yeah, there's like a dozen other methods. Hey, Craig. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, uh, as an ISP, um, now my former problem was my pipe were more filled by the attackers. Now it's going to be my server who is going to be attacked. So should I go and move my protection service to uh, match those IP sources and so on, plus what the servers uh, are doing and getting, like with the HA proxy? Because obviously we've got like two sources of data who are uh, useful for our metrics. What's your thinking about that? Uh, I think I didn't, didn't get that right. I'm, I'm not sure. You mean like if you're getting attacked by Layer 7, you have attacker IPs? Or well, or? I've, I'll still get my uh, source, ASN source, uh, IP sources, and so on. So do yeah. you match those two informations to get uh, a decent... Uh, oh, so you like, like... A decent metric for your protection. Ah, so you mean um, if it would be useful to match maybe the link that traffic's coming from? For instance, and maybe also y yeah. does the RPK is good for this traffic, uh, do, does the signing is good, does they have row as and those kind of stuff? Yeah, that should should be th some things that uh, you should do. Of course, uh, match on Bogones, match on your own IP space. Why would uh, you get that from externally yeah, and obviously. stuff like that? So okay. yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Next question, please. Hello. So basically trying to compare your solutions one to three uh, versus using uh, Cloudflare during uh, crisis situations. So basically you're saying, okay, you don't have a cookie, um, throw a CAPTCHA. But uh, my concern with that is, do you think that most of the teams in different companies would be able to implement CAPTCHAs um, that can counter uh, basically bots used ah. in these attacks? Yeah. It depends on on the team, of course. Yeah, um, if you if you have an engineering department that can do something like this, um, but you can use uh, existing solutions already. Um, you can imp you could just use um, Google Recapture, for example, or H or H Capture. You don't have to implement and code the capture and everything by yourself. Just uh, present the page and then get the um, the proper information, the proper verification back. So that, that would be uh, possible to do also, yeah. Your turn. From the res uh, resource uh, balancing perspective, like you have your ser servers and you have all your ob observability tooling, your telemetry and so on, and then uh, I observed that some kind of request uh, used a an, an high amount of observability output compared to others, and in the end, we were con our conclusion was with the telemetry backline. So how do you balance? We then at one point decided just to cut off the telemetry because it was de decided that it's more important that some requests were at least answered. But how do you balance this? Or is there a good general solution or is this really domain specific? Uh, you mean you had too many requests or uh, maybe I didn't um, get that properly? We, but we got mail from uh, May? Re requests and the request caused a lot of telemetry output and this telemetry, ah, output, telemetry output okay uh, then this traffic actually did damage internally this was the issue ah well i guess our backbone is uh, uh, internal network is maybe bigger than yours then we have in enough in internal capacity to uh, to handle that well of course you see the spike and if you collect like everything then you have several terabytes of data but i can buy a server that host that so I have budget so <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's always nice to have yes and you have a question yeah thank you that was a great talk um, thanks do you ever see issues with WebSockets? because I know that's becoming more of a thing that web developers uh. like to use 
Because I can imagine people could then pipe data in. Yeah, web sockets are long lived and we really hate them. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't have many customers that uh, are using them. So um, and there's customers that attract DDoS traffic a lot. And fortunately, uh, the customers that are using web sockets, uh, web sockets, they're not the ones attracting the uh, DDoS. So yeah, it's a bit, it's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, any more questions there? Yes, please. Thank you for your great talk. Um, REST APIs are more common now. How do you protect them from DDoS without such methods as the challenges you showed us? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, there's probably different, different methods for that. Um, maybe... Maybe you have another endpoint for um, your, the first request to authenticate, and then you feed that back with an API to the other system, like you have a login thing uh, on, on one subdomain. Uh, and if that's verified, only then you can access the other one, because there's a layer 4 uh, filter on it, or something like that. This is a very quick idea. I, I don't know. Um, there's, there's probably some other better methods, too. <laughs> All right. Your question. So if you're already uh, redirecting these attackers to a capture service, um, have you maybe looked into doing any um, more offensive uh, mitigation techniques like tar pits or gzip bombs once the attacker fails the captcha? I've, with this anonymous attack back then, weblog runs in a browser. If you redirect that browser to someplace else, it will go there. So uh, you can redirect it to, I don't know, well, it would be really uh, evil to redirect them to your competition, or, but uh, yeah, you, you can redirect them and do stuff with them if it's browser-based. Also, if they use a headless browser to, to do some stuff, but um, yeah, it's better to detect and uh, block them. Tar pitting, yeah, it's an, it's an option, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, one more question. Yes, yes. please. Um, so commercial products are quite mature now. So do you see... Wh wh which product? Co commercial products, hardware ah. commercial products. You think you so? <laughs> <laughs> well, the vendors are saying that, right? Uh, do you see any limitations in them? I, I mean, why would you go this route when, let's say, you have the yeah. budget and you can... Yeah. Take some... I mean, what are the advantages on this one? Yeah, so... Um, a solution you buy is often not scalable, right? So then you have one box, it can do 100 gigabits on prime or something like that. And then if you want to add another one, they say, oh, no, uh, you can't just add an, uh, a second box. You have to buy this bigger box. It can do a terabit, and it costs more like a house. So um, it, it's not really scalable, I think. Um, and also, you always need two, because what happens if there's a software update? Uh, of course, you need twice the capacity all the time. Or if you have three, well, you, you, well, you, you get the point. Um, and also, I think um, some of these mitigation solutions aren't really market ready. Because we had a, a solution and tested it, uh, and we had another one in production, and it had issues with, uh, it could serve captchas, but it can't look into TLS 1.2 traffic. Well. Yeah, not very helpful anymore, right? And then um, it also would serve the CAPTCHAs which, uh, with an HTTP 200 code, which means if the Google bot is coming, it's indexing all these sites, and then um, the index is fucked. So, yeah. And with our own solution, we can just uh, adjust it, uh, what, whatever we want to do, and have different levels of um, um, uh, verifications, for example. Or we can do start with the easy verification and it's like a maze that an attacker would have to go through like start with a simple proof of work then some redirect javascript uh, pff, and and all these and they have to code something for that in a row and when they think they're finished they will meet they will see uh, the next thing all right there's one last question in the queue please so I've seen um, HA proxy in, in your presentation, so I assume you're using HA proxy as a load balancer. Um, what would be your recommendation for, uh, for example, for the firewalls or the other components? 
Yeah, well, everyone likes open source, uh, so I would recommend using some, some open so source things that you can debug, actually. Uh, for HAProx, you have the source code. Uh, even if you don't buy the professional version, you have very, very good support because they're really interested in getting uh, having a good product, right? So some of these fixes, they're done in less than 24 hours. Um, which is really great. So I would always recommend using open source and not buy a very big box from a vendor. But also including APIs as you recommended, right? Yeah, for, for APIs, usually um, if, if you have a more complex system, it's very specific to your environment. Because for us, it's web hosting, I'll just block UDP, who cares, right? Uh, but if you're a gaming provider, you can't block UDP because your games use it. So you need to, to design very differently. So in the end, it's a whole system that's being designed with different components. And of course, this is not everything we have. It's uh, a lot more stuff that's interconnected and giving and sharing information. So, yeah. All right, right behind you, another question spawned. You said about coding something for the proof of work uh, protections. Uh, are we talking about like computing it on the attacker nodes or some form of bypassing it? Uh, some some what bypassing? Some form of bypassing the some protection. For formal? Form of. Form of, okay. Well, it could, could be anything. If, if you have a really big botnet and you have a um, computational proof of work, um, your bots would have, each bot would individually have to calculate the, the formula and stuff. So you could code that, of course, yeah. Or have a, have a headless browser execute it, um, and then you have the result and feed that into the client. But that also requires you to code a lot of stuff so your botnet can attack. And then uh, we will just use another mitigation for that. All right, thank you very much for the questions. If you have any questions later, I'm pretty sure Craig will stay around and you can ask him later. But for now, uh, let's thank him again for his great insights on DDoS. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.